Hello, I'm Carrie Parker, the Executive Director of the Wisconsin Council of Churches. And we recently released a document on church music in the age of COVID-19, part of our set of resources on returning to church. I am glad to bring a conversation to you today with Dr. Joff Swain, who has been one of our consultants and advisors when it comes to scientific information. We wanna make sure we're bringing you accurate information. So Joff, would you tell us a little bit about your background so folks know who we're having a conversation with? Sure. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Carrie. Um, I, I really appreciate being here. I'm a, a board-certified family physician. I've spent my entire career as a public health physician, uh, both in practice as the medical director for the City of Milwaukee Health Department and as a teacher, as a faculty member for uh, the, either the Medical College of Wisconsin during the first half of my career and the um, U University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health in the second half. I've got um, close to 27 years of experience in public health practice now. And um, although no one has gone through a uh, global pandemic like we are currently in, I have had uh, quite a bit of experience with uh, communicable disease management and outbreak management in general. That's really helpful to us in this moment. I know you've come out of retirement to volunteer with the Department of Health Services, and they put us in touch with one another uh, when we knew that there were churches all over Wisconsin that needed a little bit of help understanding what are riskier behaviors and what's perhaps a little bit on the spectrum of less risky as we think about gathering together as God's people. Could you talk a little bit about that spectrum of risk? Yes, sure. So um, the, the main way the virus is transmitted is through these larger respiratory droplets, they're not really large by, by uh, layperson standards, but from a medical perspective, they're relatively larger. And as a result, they tend to fall out of the air fairly quickly over a matter of a couple minutes, and they don't get very far away. Uh, so when you cough or sneeze in particular, but even with talking, these droplets are just present, and they usually fall to the ground within about six feet. And this is why we are recommending in general that when people are out in a place where they might be together physically, whether that's a grocery store or a church or other places, uh, that they, first of all, try to stay at least six feet away from each other because the droplets just don't go any farther, uh, usually. And secondly, that they wear a cloth face covering over the nose and mouth. This doesn't really protect the wearer so much as it protects other people from the wearer. And because we know that this virus can be transmitted by people who don't have any symptoms or by people who don't yet have symptoms, um, none of us really know for sure if we might be infectious. And so wearing that cloth face covering and staying six feet away from everybody else helps protect uh, each other from each other and, and shows really from a, from a faith community point of view the way that we are called to care for each other. Now, a, a, a other ways this virus is transmitted um, are from contaminated surfaces, frequently touched surfaces like doorknobs or um, you know, uh, the gas pump handle at the gas station, for example. Um, this is less common, but it is an issue, and this is why um, frequently cleaning those surfaces makes sense and having hand sanitizer available. The least uh, a common way that this is spread in the general population is through what we call aerosols. These are very, very fine droplets, super extra fine, and instead of falling to the ground fairly quickly, they're so fine and so light that they float in the air for a long time. And so they are infectious because they're so small, they can get very deeply into the lungs and they can move across a whole room or even uh, a, a building. And in most circumstances, these are not of practical significance, but the reason we're here today is to talk about a circumstance in which they are of practical significance and that's singing. So I've heard that you really couldn't design a, a better environment for sharing the virus than the places like the church, the sorts of things we do in the church. We project our voices in common speech. We really project them when we're preaching. We sing extensively both as soloists, as cantors, and as a body together. And as we look to come together as church, so what's the implication of that? 
Right. So I think your document, um, which is really excellently done, uh, lays this out uh, in, a, in a logical way. We know that there are some of these fine aerosols, a small amount that happen even just with normal breathing, and the talking is, uh, you know, an activity that creates a little bit more of those aerosols. Um, but in most day-to-day um, -day situations, that doesn't seem to be uh, too big of a practical risk for transmission of the virus. But it does, again, help to have these cloth face coverings. Um, but the louder people talk, the more those aerosols are generated. And then singing, uh, it's much more. So this is um, really gets to why um, your organization and, and I as a public health professional, uh, unfortunately, and, and, and with a great deal of sadness and regret, have to recommend at the moment that singing in churches and other houses of worship is really probably too dangerous right now and that it should be avoided in order to protect all of us, in, in, including really everyone, but especially the most vulnerable among us. I know a lot of people are heartbroken about this reality. We've, we've come up singing. Um, there's, there's a statement that when you sing, you pray twice. Um, and it's, it's really true what happens in the spirit when we sing together. It, you know, it synchronizes our hearts. It raises our spirits. And so I wonder if we could reflect together for a few minutes on the yeses instead of the noes, because we've said an awful lot of noes in front of people. What are, what are things that might be safer or accommodations we could offer so we can still keep church music in our lives? Right. I think there's a lot of opportunity for uh, creative uh, uh, thinking in this area. And, um, you know, certainly there's plenty of ways to have inspirational music in the church um, that don't involve singing. Plenty of them that are, are, you know, things that churches normally do, a piano or an organ, um, uh, stringed instruments, um, uh, you know, at really any instrument at all other than, um, than a wind instrument uh, is, is, is really fine. Um, so those are all possibilities. And now I think we're also starting to learn more about um, new ways of doing things, just as you and I are currently talking on the um, Zoom video conference. Um, there are ways to do uh, pre-recorded video of, of, of soloists, people singing, or even uh, groups. That if you have, say, a family that's all musically inclined and, you know, they're all in the same household anyway, they could record choral music in their own home, just themselves. And this could be um, played back both in audio and in video um, during a service. Uh, and for people who have in, uh, in their congregation, someone who is even slightly more technically inclined, there's ways to <clears throat> develop synchronization tracks in which you can have multiple people in different homes uh, independently recording their own vocal part of a, of a, of a choral piece and then synchronize those together into a video. And you see this being done, you know, in many ways across the country right now from, you know, uh, orchestras to, you know, um, <laughs> you know, any sort of genre of music you can imagine. And, and churches can do this too. We just have to remember when we play those in church that we don't inadvertently start a congregational sing-along, right? Yes, I think that's important. And so, um, we have to, you know, I think we do, when, when we're in church, we have to think about, like, what's our, um, our, our pact, our, our, our agreement, our, mm -hmm. our, 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 our um, uh, mutual understanding of how we care for each other and what, you know, remembering what we shouldn't be doing. We shouldn't be singing along, you know, humming. It's, uh, there's not a lot of evidence, but it's probably a little more risky in terms of aerosols than talking is. Um, so if we all understand that, we all agree to it, then let's enjoy what we can enjoy with instrumental music, with pre-recorded music. Uh, your, your heart can sing even when your vocal cords are being quiet. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's no reason people can't sing at home in their own households. Absolutely no reason at all. In fact, I think that's something that churches can encourage and, and really should encourage. 
um, you know, there is no reason and perhaps it's a, a judgment free zone if you're a little bit worried about folks criticizing your singing when you're in public. This is your opportunity, folks. Yes, exactly. Um, the only time I'm willing to be a soloist as a singer is when I'm in the shower. Other than that, uh, if I'm not buried in a large group, I really don't want people hearing my singing, but I do enjoy singing. Dr. Swain, you've been really generous with your time with the council and here today as we've been reflecting on this new set of recommendations that have been released. Do you have anything else you'd like to share for folks as we're talking about music in the church over the next perhaps 12 to 18 months as we wait for a vaccine to be in mass production and available to the public? Yeah, I think uh, it is important to understand how, how long this epidemic is going to be with us. Um, and you know, there's many things that I'm um, frustrated about and sad about, uh, both you know, as, a, as a physician, as a public health professional, and as a person of faith. And, and yet, um, the virus is the way it is. And uh, we are, we are uh, right now, almost all of us remain susceptible because a very, very tiny proportion of us has actually been infected. And we don't even know the degree to which people are immune or the length of time they may be immune after they're infected. So we really have to um, care for each other in this way. Think about this, ourselves and each other. In this sense, we, we're, we're all vulnerable to this virus. Any one of us might be infectious and not know it. None of us wants to inadvertently hurt someone else. And so for the next um, year or so, we have to figure out new ways of staying connected with each other, um, you know, uh, physically and not within six feet, but other than that, you know, emotionally, spiritually, um, and, and, and really focus on the things that we can do and keep each other safe uh, in the process. So the recap is, it is not safe, we believe, to be singing together in public. And so you advise against that, even with a face mask. You advise oh, against- Oh, that's absolutely correct. Okay. Right. So remember, I think, thank you for bringing that up. The, the, the face covering is reasonably effective at preventing regular large Size respiratory droplets from mainly coughing and sneezing and to some degree from talking. It, it, it traps those. But these fine aerosols that uh, singing uh, creates, the vibration from the vocal cords and the strength of the, the diaphragm and the lungs as you're singing and the volume, these fine aerosols very easily get out through the sides of that mask. It's really not protecting you or anybody else from aerosols. And you would offer the same caution about wind instruments, that that would not be on the spectrum of safer choices in the church. I recommend against wind instruments from what we know. And, you know, the science is, and there's still um, a lot of gaps in it. But from what we know and from what we can um, interpret and interpolate from the data that we have, um, I think that uh, wind instruments are, are unwise in the same in the same qualitative way that singing is unwise. Um, you know, we don't really have the data to say, uh, I don't know, a, um, a trumpet is more safe or less safe than a saxophone or a flute. I, but, but in general, we know that noise, you know, sound, music is created by vibrations in the air. And the vibrations in the air, just like the vibrations in your larynx when you're singing, are taking these larger droplets and chopping them up into these little tiny aerosols. And so until we, you know, know more with more confidence that, you know, a certain instrument is actually okay, uh, I would avoid wind instruments. I, I for sure I would. And so all of that being said, we know that music is good for the soul and we want to find ways to continue to incorporate music in our lives that are less risky so that way we can preserve that tradition for the day when we can come back together and sing and rejoice and make music as the Psalms encourage us to do. Precisely. And I really appreciate the work that the Wisconsin Council of Churches has been doing uh, in general on helping 
uh, churches and faith communities understand uh, how they might get back together safely now, um, and in particular on this issue of singing. And certainly I would encourage you know, anyone who is watching this video and has further questions to get in touch with the Wisconsin Council of Churches. And Carrie, you have my uh, word that I remain available to you if I can be of further help as some of these questions come in. You are very knowledgeable already because you're a quick study on this and probably can answer most questions. But if some come in and you want to get some additional um, perspective from a public health professional, I'm happy to be there. Super. Folks, if you're looking for more information, our website is wichurches.org, and we do have a contact form on the front page of our website. Again, Dr. Swain, thank you for your time today and your consultation all along through this pandemic. We are grateful for your friendship. You're very welcome, and thank you for all you've been doing.